Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the ICNC Academic Webinar Series. Um, today, we have with us Indigenous Rights Attorney Sherry Mitchell and the Coordinator of Undergraduate Programs in Conflict Resolution at Portland State University, Tom Hastings. My name is David Reinbold, and I'm the Coordinator of Digital Initiatives at the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Today's webinar takes a look at Native Americans' nonviolent struggle for rights and justice. Sherry Mitchell was born and raised on the Penobscot Indian Nation. She is an Indigenous rights attorney and a global advocate for human rights and earth rights. She received her JD and a certificate in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy from the University of Arizona's James E. Rogers College of Law. Sherry is also an alum of the Udall Native American Congressional Internship Program and the American Indian Ambassador Program. Sherry has worked as an advocate for Indigenous rights for the past 20 years. She has served as a program coordinator and advisor to the American Indian Institute's Healing the Future Program and Traditional Circle of Indian Elders and Youth. And she is currently an advisor to the Indigenous Elders and Medicine People's Council of North and South America. She worked as a law clerk for the solicitor of the United States Department of Interior, as an associate with Fredericks, Peebles, and Morgan, and as an educator for the Civil Rights Division of the Maine Attorney General's Office. In 2010, Sherry received the Mahoney Dunn International Human Rights and Humanitarian Award for her research into human rights violations against Indigenous peoples. She is an accomplished writer and speaker, having been featured in numerous journals, anthologies, and publications. She is a published poet and a contributor to Indian Country Today and Native News Network. She is currently completing her first book, Sacred Instructions, which is expected to be released in September 2017. She has worked with countless individuals and groups, helping them to devise legal strategies for rights-based action, while also teaching in-depth workshops that focus on the details of building strong, effective, nonviolent rights-based movements. Sherry is the founder and director of the Land Peace Foundation, an organization dedicated to the protection of indigenous rights and the preservation of the indigenous way of life. She also is co-host of the program Love and Revolution Radio, a program that focuses on heart-based movements around the world. Tom Hastings, with his undergraduate degree in Peace and Conflict Studies, his master's in journalism, and his doctorate in education, is coordinator of the undergraduate degree programs in conflict resolution at Portland State University. He is a former member of the Governing Council of the International Peace Research Association, former co-chair of the Peace and Justice Studies Association, and is on the boards of both the IPRA Foundation and the Oregon Peace Institute, as well as the Academic Advisory Council of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. He is founding director of Peace Voice, a program of OPI, and has written several books and many articles about nonviolence and other peace and conflict topics. He is a former plowshares resistor, a nonviolence trainer, a founding member of two Catholic worker communities, and currently lives in White Feather Peace House. His sons are African American, which literally colored his perspective on the world since the 1960s. And with that, I will now pass full control over to Sherry, and she and Tom can begin the presentation. Thank you, David. Hello, welcome. As uh, always, when uh, we start off a gathering together, it's always uh, good to start in prayer. So I would like for us to start with a brief prayer uh, to get our minds in a good place so that we can uh, start thinking about some of these things in a good way together. Uh, would you come in, Kachiniwas? Nicholas Kachinik. Kachiwiliwan, would you come in? Bukami, Mosin. Moliwan, Nube, Squadron, Majelson. And Nicholas Kachinik. And Kamach Kazamu. And down the Pamuk. So thank you for joining us today. We are going to only be able to touch very briefly on a fraction of the information that could be contained within this subject matter. The um, issue of nonviolent struggle for Native American people has a, is very long, and it is, uh, dates back to prior to there being any European co contact. Um, and so I want to try to set a framework um, as we begin today to help people to understand why it's important to pay attention to indigenous rights. 
it's important to pay attention to the rights of indigenous peoples uh, today because these rights are foundational. Felix Cohen once said that the American Indian was the miner's canary and that our treatment of Indians signified the difference between um, fresh air and poisonous gas within our political system. When we think about that quote, it's almost prophetic because the things that American Indian people have been suffering for decades, uh, centuries in this country are now starting to leak out into the commons and they're starting to impact other people. And so when we think about the foundational rights of this country, we have to think about the way that the United States government treats the original inhabitants of this land. And we have to look at that treatment and understand that when we do not make a stand to protect the rights of indigenous peoples, that we are essentially sanctioning the, right, the mistreatment of all other peoples in this land. And so as uh, indigenous people, what we hope people understand is that uh, we're truly connected in regard to our struggle for rights and justice because the rights that we hope to have honored for our own people are the same rights that we would hope to have honored for others. And so the foundation of determining how people are going to be treated in this country going forward is, is seated really in the rights of indigenous people. Many of you are aware that there are a number of struggles going on currently around the world um, to protect indigenous rights. There are people every day, indigenous people every single day that are being removed from their lands forcibly, um, most often for the sake of industry, and that those people are being denied the basic rights that have been established under both domestic and international law. And so we're going to look at some of the issues that have been faced, but it's impossible for us to address all of them um, today in this one 30 to 35 minute presentation. Tom, did you have anything that you wanted to add before we move forward? No, just that I agree with you and that uh, we are now entering an era in the United States in particular of the serious need for coalition and I think that uh, this is one aspect of it that that uh, is too often overlooked uh, and and I hope today can help be a part of that shift. Thank you. And that's true. It's really important for us to be looking at coalition building and we're going to talk later on in the webinar about how to be an effective ally. Uh, to indigenous rights issues. And as we sort that out, as we try to manage all of the intersectionality of all of the movements that are going on around um, the country, the underlying um, premise that we have to unify our movements cannot be overstated. That we, in order to be able to reach the tipping point that we hope to be able to achieve to um, have enough people rise up unified in protection of um, any one issue, it's critical for us to join our movements together. And right now what we're facing with so many issues being thrust um, into the public sphere is that we have a lot of people that are rising up right now that have never been active in their lives before. And so they're coming to um, this role of activism without a lot of experience without a lot of awareness of some of the other things that are going on. So being able to reach out to educate people, to help people to understand the connections between these issues. Um, indigenous rights issues touch on every other issue. And so there are you know, civil rights issues, there are human rights issues, there are environmental justice issues, there are race issues. All of those things touch on indigenous rights issues. And so as we move forward, and try to create a more just and humane way of being uh, with one another and with Mother Earth, it's important for us to recognize the importance of bringing our movements together. When we talk about nonviolent struggle, I think it's important to recognize that um, 
there were a number of struggles that had already taken place in this land prior to European contact and that the native peoples of this land, especially in the Northeast region where I'm from, um, you know, I'm in the Wabanaki Confederacy and the Iroquois Confederacy is our nearest neighbor. We have a peace accord with the Iroquois um, Confederacy that we created through um, the transmission of wampum belts long before Europeans came to this land. And during that time, the Iroquois League of Peace was formed the um, Hiawatha and Deganawida in their work to create peace among the, amongst the Iroquois nations um, and through the creation of the Guyana Chagall, which is a great law of peace, had already done the work of creating peaceful movements um, between groups of people. So that was done within the Iroquois Confederacy. That was done between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Wabanaki Confederacy um, here in this region, that much of the work of being able to form uh, peaceful relations with others had already been occurring on this land and um, you know we had already established and been operating democratic forms of government uh, much of the um, the influence um, that we had in regard to the forming of the United States was in regard to our established democratic forms of governance um, which honored both the men and women equally um, and so Native peoples have a lot to offer in the discussion of building, maintaining, and sustaining nonviolent movements um, because we've been doing it now for hundreds of years. And I um, wanted to point that out as we began this process today that there's a long history of, of nonviolence uh, established within the culture that um, that we offer um, in our discussion today. Tom, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I just think it's interesting that the methods of conflict management that are indigenous were interrupted by contact, by invasion, by occupation, by Europeans. So we don't know uh, where Native Americans would be at this point in their methods of conflict management had they not been interrupted. To me, they had some really interesting methods that they were exploring. For example, counting coup. I just find that really interesting. And it was brought forward. And by counting coup, I mean where a warrior uh, simply touches another warrior to say, basically, I am brave enough to face you. I don't want to kill you. You can now take yourself out of play in this conflict. Mm -hmm. A very interesting uh, technique and, and uh, my friend, the late Walter Brissett, brought that forward uh, in the 1990s. Uh, he was given <clears throat> by a, a very circuitous method, he was given the original war club of uh, uh, um, Black Hawk and uh, he took that war club he climbed the fence at a mining site on the Flambeau River in northern Wisconsin and went up to uh, an earth-moving piece of equipment, a big bulldozer that was getting ready to start constructing this very dirty mine and he simply counted coup on the tire of this uh, earth mover and then sat down and waited to be arrested. It was one of the most brilliant nonviolent warrior acts that I've ever heard of. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk more about the practice of counting coup when we talk about um, warrior philosophy, but I think that that's really important to, you know, recognize that um, the purpose of that is to let the other party know that um, I'm close enough that I could choose to hurt you if that were my intention. It's not my intention to hurt you. I honor your right to live and I am asking you to honor my right to live as well. And so that respect and that honor for life was embedded within those practices. Um, and, you know, that's something that we're going to talk about as we go forward. So the first thing that we wanted to do was just to give people, and we're just going to kind of speed through this piece, um, give people a brief overview of where the 
history of rights within a legal construct began um, in this country. Um, and many of you may already know this, that the doctrine of discovery was the foundational document for the basis of legal rights that were claimed by the United States. Um, essentially, the United States claimed that it was a successor in interest to the conquest rights that the Europeans had gained under um, the laws of conquest from the Christian law of nations, uh, which was developed through a series of papal bulls that came from the Pope. And so what's interesting about that is that the very first act um, in regard to uh, legal assertion of rights over indigenous lands was a violation of the Constitution. The Constitution actually demanded the very beginning separation of church and state. The United States Supreme Court in its first act of claiming legal authority over tribal lands used the Christian law of nations to justify its taking of Indian lands under the laws of conquest. And so it began with a series of three papal bulls uh, Dum de Versus essentially was um, one of the main um, documents that gave authority to the um, King of Portugal to enlarge the slave trade uh, in Africa. And so building upon Dum de Versus, uh, Romanist Pontifex um, confirmed their authority to expand even further um, in, into Africa the enslavement and the taking of, of land. So it began in Africa uh, and then that was transferred, that same practice was transferred to the United States and into Satira, which is the papal bull that Columbus used to claim rights over the land in the Americas. And so when you understand that the very beginning of federal Indian law is founded upon a violation of the Constitution and then we're dealing with countless violations of treaties in the hierarchy of U.S. laws, the Constitution is the highest law in the land followed immediately by treaty law. But the U.S. has been willing and has been intent upon breaking its own laws in order to violate the rights of indigenous peoples on this land that um, it sets up a precarious position for anyone who hopes that the law is going to have some authority to protect them going forward. And we're beginning to see how that is unraveling and how Felix Cohen's quote is becoming prophetic as people's lands are being taken, non-native people's lands are being taken by eminent domain for the sake of industry. There's no difference between that and the takings of land from indigenous people. It's just a different legal justification um, for that taking. But it's the same action being repeated. It's the same act of conquest that's still unfolding within this land. We're still actively engaged in the process of conquest here. And so when you understand where these laws originated, you begin to understand the ongoing practice of conquest that indigenous people are still struggling with, that we're still standing up against. Uh, we've been speaking on behalf of the earth since the day the newcomers arrived. Our message hasn't changed. The only thing that's different now is the way that that message is being delivered and framed. And the fact that we now do have allies who are joining us in that because the places that they hold sacred are now being violated. Their homes are now being invaded. Their environments are now being contaminated. So they're waking up to the things that the Native peoples have been saying for hundreds of years here, and they're starting to stand with us and join us. But this is steeped in a long history of injustice that we have been standing against here um, for a very long time. And the Marshall Trilogy is three cases. Um, they were three cases that are kind of the foundational cases for federal Indian law. And this is where Johnson v. McIntosh, the first case, um, and I'm not going to go through and read all of the specifics underneath, underneath each of these cases, um, you know, but if you're not familiar with the history, I encourage you to go back and to review it and to understand how these um, came into play and how they continue to impact that these three cases, the Marshall Trilogy still founds, forms the basis for federal Indian law today and it's still active. 
So in this first case, Johnson v. McIntosh, this is the case in which the Christian law of nations and doctrine of discovery was incorporated into U.S. law in this Supreme Court decision. And <clears throat> excuse me, this is where the U.S. claimed that they were a successor in interest to all the lands that the Europeans had discovered. Um, and therefore, the rights of tribal people was limited, the sovereign rights of tribal people, even though they were being recognized as nations, and there was a nation-to-nation -nation relationship that was being developed, um, the U.S. was already in the process of eliminating what sovereignty meant. And so when you try to eliminate the meaning of a word, you change um, the meaning. And so when the U.S. Uh, enacted these cases, um, there was some implication that they were protective of indigenous rights in some ways. Um, however, what we've learned through their enactment over time is that um, they have been, you know, simply designed to strip away the rights of the people. And so here, rather than being full sovereigns, in the second case, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, the U.S. Supreme Court said that they created this guardian ward type relationship by claiming that Native people were domestic dependent nations um, who were living under the guardianship of the U.S. And so that framed not only the legal relationship, but it framed a lot of the ideology um, that has evolved within this country in regard to how Native peoples are treated. They're treated as though they're incapable of being able to take care of themselves. And Native people are incredibly intelligent. Native people are incredibly creative, um, have incredible opportunities and abilities to be able to solve many of their own problems. However, the oppression of this guardianship that has been forced upon us um, and also the oppression of these laws that have stripped away our ability to be able to act on our own behalf has prohibited us from being able to engage um, the world in a way that's meaningful to us. So there are all these laws and rules that have been set up that actually interfere with and disrupt our way of life. Uh, and that way of life is what guides us and how we engage um, the world around us. And we had a good relationship with the world around us for thousands of years before contact. And so, you know, this continuous and ongoing disruption, this forced um, removal from our lands, this forced um, destruction of our environment. So, you, you know, we're seeing that clear example of that at Standing Rock where you have a community in Bismarck, North Dakota that is largely white that says, oh no, this risk is too great for our people, and yet Indian people are forced at gunpoint to accept that risk. Their sacred lands are defiled in the process. And so, you know, the, the ability of Indian people to be able to live in balance, uh, to live in a productive way with the lands that surround them, to live in a way that honors and respects all life, is constantly and continuously being disrupted by ongoing acts of conquest that we're facing on a daily basis. And all of that began with these three cases. Um, called the Marshall Trilogy. And so the final case in Worcester v. Georgia, essentially the United States claimed plenary power um, over Indian tribes, saying that the federal government was the only one that had the authority to be able to determine um, what happened uh, in regard to Indian lands and, and Indian tribes. Essentially, they didn't want anybody else benefiting from the sale of Indian lands, so they didn't want Indian nations who, um, on one hand, they claimed were sovereign, to be negotiating with other sovereigns, such as France, um, to sell their lands. Um, so they created this law that protected the U.S. government's rights and interests over tribal lands. Anything to add, Tom? Only that I think it's, it's so fascinating that these uh, tributaries of, of uh, uh, of legal rulings kind of feed together over a period of time uh, to
to create ultimately what I would call a river of resistance. It's a braided river, uh, mm -hmm. but the, um, the cases that uh, came forward from the civil rights movement fed into uh, the cases that uh, enabled nonviolent resistance to go forward based on treaty rights so that all of these things now are, are able to be joined. And I, I mean, basically what I tell students is, you show me a campaign, a nonviolent campaign that succeeded, and I will show you a multi-pronged campaign. Oftentimes, right. the, the legal aspects of it are m much less dramatic, more in the background, but they are equally important to what we do in the streets or uh, the blockades we set up or any other uh, dramatic acts uh, of, of nonviolent resistance, they are augmented and, and ultimately uh, greatly strengthened by all of the legal efforts. Right. And so, as you said, these are like tributaries and they've had far-reaching impacts. They've had far-reaching positive impacts. They've had far-reaching negative impacts. Um, the legal legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery and the Marshall Trilogy has traveled far. Um, there is a specific mention um, where Indian law, federal Indian law in this country is um, used as an example of a way to subjugate a people in Mein Kampf. So Hitler used federal Indian law from the United States as a guide on his march to subdue and eliminate the Jewish population. Um, it was adopted by Canada in the in the Indian Act. It was adopted by Australia in regard to their treatment of their uh, Aboriginal peoples there and also in New Zealand. Um, and the idea of reservations and the um, other tenets of federal Indian law were also incorporated into apartheid. And so what happened here is that the U.S. created a blueprint for the subjugation and genocidal elimination of peoples that was then shared around the world and has been replicated in some of the most horrific acts within our history, and yet there is still reluctance to acknowledge that that genocide occurred here, even though um, it has been used as a blueprint for other attempted genocide around the world. So now that we have a basic foundation, it's important to um, look at what it is that we hope to carry forward. And there's a distinct difference based on uh, colonization ideology of conquest, um, you know, this whole frontier mindset um, that is held within the Euro-American value system of rugged individualism. Um, the uh, amplification and glorification of, of youth and beauty, um, enhanced, unending competition. Count, you know, there are countless reality shows that are all based on competition that's very aggressive. Um, being boastful, being outspoken, learning to speak up um, and to amplify your voice in any way um, that you can in order to have people pay attention to what it is that you're trying to say um, that often comes off um, sounding very arrogant, uh, sounding very um, aggressive, sounding very um, shallow in a lot of ways, that there's, there's a, this, this um, cultural value that kind of exemplifies being loud and brash as, as being powerful in some way. Of course, um, the idea of conquering, conquest over others, um, arrogance, which is again, you know, incorporated into some of the things that are listed above, but it's a, it becomes a character trait that if you can, you know, feign confidence and, um, in your position, regardless of whether your position is right, whether it's factual, if you can arrogantly assert that position and, um, and stand by it, then that somehow gives you some sort of authority, but all of that is false. Um, this idea of saving or hoarding um, is more appropriate resources um, and 
making sure that the information that you have, the groups that you create are exclusive so that you, know, you can place yourself within some hierarchical structure of exclusivity is a very Euro-American value that's also part of this, this um, colonized conquest ideology. Um, the idea of fragmentation, that everything can be commodified into saleable parts, is a very um, Euro-American value. Uh, the idea of winning, like I won and you lose, um, that there has to be a winner and a loser. Uh, this is rampant throughout the culture. All of these things are rampant throughout the culture, and they set up a scenario that pits people against each other, that separates them, that creates division, that keeps people from, from unifying. So when we talk about creating nonviolent struggles um, for indigenous people, what, one of the things that we talk about, and it's in all of our prophecies, is this idea of being able to unify. Um, and that's based on these values where um, we're communal people. Even today, like in my tribal community, where our lands are still hold, held in common. Um, individuals are able to live upon and to have um, you know, authority over their lands, but at the end of the day, those lands are still held by the tribe. They can't pass out of tribal ownership. Um, you know, we look out for one another. We have community meals. We, um, you know, we have community cleanup. We have community gardens. We have um, community programs where the young people and the elders come together. We watch out for each other. If somebody in our community is struggling, even if we don't like them, we help them because that's how we've been raised. We've been raised to look out for each other. You know, uh, the concept of Indilma Bamak that we're all related is um, infused within us. We've been taught to honor and to value our elders, that it's a great honor to become an elder, that to grow old is a privilege that's denied to many, and that you learn so much uh, through the course of your life um, and accumulate that knowledge and the wisdom of your experience that you have to share with the younger people, whereas uh, youth and beauty is, is glorified and, you know, um, a lot of non-native people send their old people away to live on farms, you know, <laughs> it's like they, they send them away to live in some other place, um, you know, and native people tend to keep their people home or in their communities and uh, take care of them and, and look at that as an honor. Um, cooperation being able to work cooperatively with another to make sure that you're advancing the needs of the entire community is a big part of Native culture. Having patience. Um, we have patience for the struggle because we've been engaged in it for a long time. When I was a younger woman, one of the elders told me, you know, you have to remember all the time that, um, you know, this work was passed on to me by my grandparents. And now we're passing it on to you, and you're going to pass it on to your grandchildren. That, you know, we're not going to solve all of these problems in a short period of time. So you have to sit back, and you have to be smart about what you're doing, and you have to be patient. And you have to be sure that what you're engaging in, what you're contributing, is actually building unity, that it's actually supporting your cultural values and way of life. You know, that you're not engaging in the practices of the colonizers as you're doing this work. That you're not adopting their way of being and incorporating that into what you're doing. You have to have patience to do it the right way, to place your feet very carefully on this path. And so, you know, we have that patience is built into our cultural teachings. Um, we're taught to listen. We're taught to sit in the circle and to listen to the elders speak for years before um, you know, we're invited to speak and to participate in, in those discussions. And so this idea of being able to listen to people, um, not only out of respect, but to actually open up to see what you can learn. One of the problems that we have today with a lot of the movements that we do is that people don't listen to one another. They, you know, they assume that they know what the other side wants and they don't listen, so there's never any opportunity for them to find a point of cooperation or collaboration. So listening is a very important part of the work that we're doing. And it's also one of the core values that we're taught. Um, harmony, you know, living in harmony um, with the rest of the world. J is a, a word that means 
living in harmonious balance with the world around you. And so, you know, that harmony is part of that cultural teaching where we learn to honor and respect. One of our creation stories is that uh, Gutzkop, who is a man from nothing, shot an arrow into an ash tree, and the ash tree split, and we emerged from within that, from within the tree. And that isn't telling us that our parent is actually a tree. What that's telling us is that we're created out of the same foundational elements as that ash tree. Therefore, that ash tree is our relative and that we need to honor it in the same way that we honor our human family. It's teaching us that, you know, when I introduce myself as uh, Skijinui Apid uh, um, from Penawepskik, you know, that I, as a native woman from the Penobscot Nation, that I'm Penawepskik. The land is Penawepskik. The river is Penawepskik. There's no separation between me and that land and that water that we're all related, that we're all connected. So that idea of harmony is deeply entrenched within our cultural traditions. Um, humility is, is really important, you know, being able to do this work humbly um, instead of arrogantly because when you're humble, you're willing to learn. When you're humble, you're open to new ideas. Um, you know, this idea of humility is very different from shame. That there's, you know, sometimes people cross the line between humility and shame. We don't have time to get into that discussion today, but you know, the idea of being humble is, is being continuing to be open to learning something new. It's the assumption that you don't know everything, that you're still learning, you're constantly growing, that you're open to new ways of being. Um, sharing, we have, you know, this idea of intergenerational and reciprocal sharing that is embedded within the cultural, into the cultural values of our people. You know, the aunties and the grandparents help raise up the young people, then they help to take care of them when, when they're aging. They then, in turn, help bring up those who are younger than them and share the teachings with them that they've been taught. There's all of this intergenerational weaving and reciprocal sharing that goes on within our communities. When I was um, growing up, I always heard about these pound parties in our community, and whenever somebody would have a hard time or they were just getting married or they were just starting out, the community would have a pound party for them and everybody would coordinate their efforts. And everybody would bring a pound of something. So they'd bring a pound of flour, a pound of lard, a pound of sugar, a pound of salt, a pound of oats, a pound of rice, you know. Everybody would bring a pound of something so that they were completely stocking um, the, the shelves of, this, of these people that needed the help. And so, you know, that's part of our our community, you know, and uh, having giveaways and potluck ceremonies and, you know, all of these types of things are, are embedded that we have um, this uh, inclination that is undeniable to share. <clears throat> and that was something that, you know, I had witnessed and had modeled for me and still I'm having modeled for me with my with my mother and um, with my grandparents. Um, they were incredible models for that type of sharing and um, that type of, of looking out for, for one another. Um, inclusivity, the idea that, you know, we talk in a circle, which means that everybody is equal, everybody's voice gets heard, everybody's um, opinion gets, gets uh, considered, that um, we include everybody into the discussion. We make sure everybody has all of the information. That's the traditional way of doing it. This idea of hiding information and, um, you know, trying to keep it from others so that you can have a leg up on somebody is a very Euro-American way of being. That's a model of conquest. That's part of that colonized mindset. Um, the idea that we're part of one living system, wholeness, rather than uh, fragmented segments that can be broken off and commodified into saleable parts. So understanding that we're all part of, um, of one living system and that we have to honor every aspect of that living system in order to be able to be happy and healthy. You know, it's like looking at your body and saying, you know, I'm going to start selling off my organs. Um, it's crazy to think like that. You know, and it's just as crazy to think that we can break apart and start selling off um, parts of the earth into individually fragmented parts. So it started with the land, then moved on to the water. Now, through carbon credits, they want to commodify and sell off pieces of our air. 
you know, all of these elements um, of our existence. They are the sources of our survival. They're not resources to be commodified. And so understanding that and understanding our relationship with that wholeness is part of our, our foundational values. And the idea of collaborating with others in the community so that everybody wins rather than one person wins and you know others are losers. That also is part of um, that communal understanding of Zita and Dilnabamuk, that we're all in this together. Um, you know, that we're all part of one, um, one family and that when we help one another, when we work together to achieve our goals, the likelihood is that everyone will succeed rather than anyone getting left behind. And so when we start looking at the movements that we're engaged in, we start looking at the work that we're doing out in the world, all of it has to be founded within these set of core cultural values that really start to outline and define um, what we call Skutjinawebamausawagan, which is the indigenous way of life. You know, it's that red road, walking that road, and how you conduct yourself as you walk that path um, is all outlined for us within our cultural values. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Tom? Well, I think we're going to be moving into the uh, questions and comments phase uh, in a second. I only wanted to add that um, I really want to underscore everything that you've just said because I lived and worked uh, for 25 years uh, in Indian country on treaty rights issues. Uh, I worked with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And what I found again and again was when others, when people from uh, who were not on the reservation but who had various campaigns that they wanted to work on, uh, when they would uh, slow down a little bit and and have faith that this intercultural approach can work, when they listened, when they learned, then things went very well. And we had many, many victories, including shutting down military bases, including completely wiping out opposition to the exercise of uh, Anishinaabe treaty rights. This, the idea of humility, uh, the idea of, of uh, respect for everybody, and the understanding even of time. Uh, the sociologists say, well, you have this monochronic view of time where it's like Mussolini, uh, the planes will take off on time no matter what, or you have the pro polychronic view of time where uh, things are a little bit more malleable. You take the time you need to get things done and to understand each other. That is so tribal, and I was so grateful to learn all of these lessons, and they really fed into the success and the ultimate victories of every single campaign that we worked on together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, as we look at warrior philosophy, that what the true charge of the warrior is, we have a number of words that relate to warrior within our language, and I love this Sitting Bull quote because he talks about that, you know, warriors aren't what you think about as a warrior. It's not someone who fights because no one has a right to take another life. But essentially that a warrior is one who sacrifices himself for the good of others and to take care of the elderly, the defenseless, those who cannot provide for themselves. You know, the warrior speaks on behalf of those who have no voice and stands for those who can't stand for themselves. And so the work that we're doing out in the world um, is really steeped in this philosophy that's tied to all of those values of honoring life, of, you know, being, uh, living in harmonious respect. You talked about earlier about counting coup, you know, and just going back to that really quickly, that that's really about saying to your enemy, I'm right here and I could harm you, but I respect and I honor your right to live. I respect and honor uh, your children's right to live. So when I come into your camp and I, um, you know, I let you know that I've been there or I take your horses, uh, I'm leaving your children alive in the hopes that you'll also honor my right to live and, you know, the right of my children to continue to stay alive. Um, we have these two words that I just want to highlight really quickly in our language for warrior practices. Smogness is the act of actually holding back the tide of harm 
to uh, prevent the harm from coming into your community. That's what they're doing out at Standing Rock, that active resistance of holding back the tide of harm. That's part of our warrior philosophy, um, you know, called smogness. And then the second word, GINAP, is about helper. It's about serving and protecting those in the community. Um, there is no hierarchy associated with that. From the most grand to the most mundane task, you set yourself up to help by serving and protecting the community. And again, all of these things are tied to that foundational teachings. And the way that we engage our activism today is, is founded in these ancient cultural values that outline our way of life as, uh, you know, as Kijinui people, as Indian people. And there are a number of slides here that just point to um, different things that you can look to to get more information, more in-depth information. Um, Tom had shared this, um, this one here, the Walleye Warriors, uh, which was um, written by Rick Whaley and I can't read the rest, the second name, Walker Brez. Brezette. Oh. Walter Brissett. Um, and so did you want to say anything quickly about this, Tom? Um? Uh, well, it was a beautiful struggle. It was a complete victory, and the, the, uh, the struggle was 100% nonviolent discipline by the uh, Anishinaabe people. Um, I, and I think time-wise, we had better turn to yeah. uh, questions and comments. OK. And I'm just going to. Um, you know, put this up here as we go through questions and comments that, you know, there is a reason why we choose nonviolence. Um, it works. It's in alignment with our cultural values. It preserves life. It's the only thing that we can engage in that actually changes hearts and minds and allows us to collectively evolve our consciousness and move forward together. And when we're practicing justice rather than injustice, we're actually moving in the direction of our goals. When we live peacefully rather than violently, we're moving in the direction of our goals. You know, when we speak truth rather than being deceptive with others. When we respect the environment rather than abuse it. You know, when we do all of those things, we're moving away to from conquest and we're moving toward a more just, equitable society. And we're moving into alignment with our own values. So, um, As you go back through and you look at all the slides, there's a lot of op, uh, opportunities for you to, to deepen your awareness of some of the nonviolent um, struggles that have been waged throughout our history that you can look to for some inspiration and some guidance on how those things um, were done. So. Um, as we take questions and answers, we have this page on moving forward, and we encourage people to ask questions related to these specific aspects of moving forward. Um, so why don't we go ahead and turn it over to questions at this point in time? All right, great. Um, so again, just to remind people, um, you can go ahead and type your question into the uh, questions panel uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can go ahead and click on the raise hand button um, and I can go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. Um, so it looks like somebody has raised their hand. Um, let's see. Miles, if you could, uh, there you go. You can go ahead and ask your question to Tom and Sherry. Hello, Tom and Sherry. It's wonderful to be able to speak to you on this technology. Uh, my name is, is Miles Flegg. I live in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on uh, Blackfoot and seven other nations of Southern Alberta who signed Treaty Number no. 7 in 1877. What I would like to just a bit about myself quickly is um, I'm not Indigenous. However, uh, I've experienced the violence of the workplace and the violence of uh, what Pope Francis has described as savage capitalism, which I also frame as totalitarianism. And I would suggest that that is my common, my journey has brought me into this world of the indigenous uh, worldview, view of the world. And I believe that that's where we can find alliance 
because this uh, concept of savage capitalism, which is, which is actually at the root of the rot of what's wrong and what has gone wrong since 1492 with Christopher Columbus uh, imposing this, the first of totalitarianism, if we use that as the as a common ground, I think we we can create a very powerful alliance, which would move us into. Uh, in Canada, uh, we we actually consider ourselves to be multinational, but we have a long ways to go before we are actually truly multinational, and we recognize the dozen or so languages that were here first and the culture that was here first. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out to you, that word totalitarianism as a common war. What do you think? Anytime well, I, I mean, oh, Go ahead, Sherry. Well, I was just going to say, I definitely think that there are underpinnings of um, this type of brutal capitalism um, that has created a lot of the common problems that we share today um, and also has been the impetus for creating our shared history of violence. And I, I think that we're all pretty well aware that that's um, the underpinning for a lot, of, a lot of the problems that we face. But embedded within that, um, there are also a lot of histories of of racism and privilege and hierarchy um, that have to be addressed with you know caste systems all of these things are embedded ways of thinking that are attached to some form of illusory sense of superiority and so you know when we're dealing with these issues there's no one singular issue but there are certainly a lot of things that we can um, gather around and address together collectively because it's in our best interest such as the protection of the water we can't solve any of our other problems, um, no matter how nuanced we believe that we are in discussing them, if we can't survive because we don't have water. That's a unifying issue that we can all, um, you know, collectively work around. And, and there are a number of other things that we all agree on, basic human and civil rights, that we can all kind of rally around um, for central issues. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I think that it it's important to have sort of concomitant uh, strands within uh, various campaigns and movements, which, by which I mean uh, while you are finding those common interests and shared values which are uh, exceedingly important to do and to build campaigns around those, it's also important at the very same time to be conduct conducting uh, awarenesses of uh, sort of relative uh, privilege, as Sherry uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the residuals of empire, um, and to acknowledge this is how we were divided and conquered for so long. These people have this long history of being part of the divide and conquer, and how do we rectify this? How do we uh, heal and go forward together? And that, to me, is is very possible to do at the very same time that you are advancing together politically. Uh, if you do them separately without each other, uh, it's not going to work out very well. I think they have to be done together. All right, great. Thank you. Um, another question uh, that just came in, somebody says, um, the more I hear about these stories, the deeper they enter me. My question addresses what you both just talked about regarding time uh, and patience. Uh, with the extreme danger the Earth is under now, how do we remain patient with those who seem to mean to destroy it? Um, we no longer have hundreds of years, but only decades possibly. Uh, the issue of water is at last stand status. Um, how do we maintain the patience necessary for nonviolent resistance? That's a big question, and I think that that's probably one of the biggest questions that we're facing right now um, in the work that we're doing. And again, I go back to this practice of samagnas, that um, being patient does not mean being passive, that we engage the process and we put ourselves in the path of the harm that's coming toward us, and we do everything within our power to stop that harm without harming the other. That's that process of samagnas. 
that we have to put ourselves in the path of harm to be able to prevent what is happening. Um, we also have to actively be engaged in creating new systems. We have this, um, you know, one of the outcroppings of the patriarchy and uh, colonialism is this idea of dependence. Um, it's not just the guardian ward dependence that I talked about earlier, but we have this childlike dependence on some other solving our problems. So we look to leaders, we look to government to solve our problems. We have to let go of that childlike dependence. And we have to be willing behind, to be working behind the wall that's holding back the harm. We have to have, you know, another group of people who are working to build systems that allow people to exit the systems that are destroying our possibility of survival on the planet, that we have to be actually creating um, the type of world that we want to step into, that we can no longer be waiting for others to do that for us. So, you know, being patient, continuing to do that work, keeping your, you know, shoulder to the wheel does not mean that you're not actively engaged. Um, one of the um, common myths is that nonviolent struggle is passive, and it's not. It's extremely active. Um, and Tom, I bet there's something you have to say about, about that as well. Very briefly, because you just stated it all uh, perfectly, and that is to think about what I call the triple A, uh, where you have apathy, assertion, and aggression. And if you choose either apathy or aggression, you're not going to win stick with assertion, which is exactly, I think, what Sherry was talking about. All right, great. Um, Tom and Sherry, we have quite a few questions coming in. Are you okay to stay for another 10 minutes so we can go through some of the, the questions? Sure. I'm okay to stay for 10 minutes, Tom. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so another person asks, um, you described this multi-pronged approach. Do you think there is sufficient support for the legal issues uh, for the Standing Rock situation? Um, I'm disheartened as an engineer when I see a lack of professional work with EIS and the lack of judicial action. So what are the other prongs as a non-native citizen to help prevent the militarized occupation and removal of peaceful, prayerful people that have been witnessing uh, in North Dakota? Well, I mean, personally, I think that there are a lot of things that people can do. They can start engaging within their own communities um, and organizing within their own communities to pass resolutions, to stand up, to, um, you know, sign petitions, to approach and to flood their local um, political leaders, to force them to actually stop the onslaught against indigenous rights. Um, we have a group of allies here in the state uh, of Maine where I am who are actively working to build a network of people to say to our um, political leaders, you know, we are no longer going to stand by and quietly accept your mistreatment of indigenous peoples in this territory. And I think that people need to be saying that all over the country, and they need to make that message loud and clear. Um, however, we also are facing, in regard to some of these environmental issues, um, the issue at Standing Rock is seated in an indigenous rights issue, but it's also an environmental justice issue. And so we're seeing the spill out of these issues into, you know, the commons where other people are being impacted by some of these same activities. It used to just be they would put their uh, nuclear waste dump sites and their uranium mines right on tribal land, but now, um, you know, that's leaching out, okay? So it went from being only in Indian lands to then being in fringe communities like Appalachia where there was the rural poor. You know, and now it's starting to seep out into the mainstream where everybody is being affected by this. So, you know, if we don't unify around these issues, demand that the rights of indigenous peoples, which is really the front line of environmental protection right now, because the lands that, have, uh, that remain untouched largely are in the hands of indigenous people. And if you don't stand up to protect the rights of indigenous peoples to protect those lands, then we lose our ability to claim any protection for them once they get into the hands of government, who is now just an arm of industry. And so, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do. Yeah, get politically active, put pressure on politicians, make sure that you organize and get them out of office if they continue to contribute to these types of things. You know, bird dog all of those politicians and make sure that they understand exactly what's at stake for them if they continue to behave in these ways. 
Um, and it needs to be big and it needs to be active and it needs to be involved. Uh, and it needs to have a really strong foundational base where all groups are brought into um, the movement. So, um, you know, rather than just being discouraged, uh, demand accountability and make sure that you're following that up with political action. I think that that's one of the things that you can do, um, you know, and organize within your own communities to make sure that it's not just being viewed um, as a singular issue because it's really easy for people to ignore indigenous rights issues and that is also part of that psychological training um, that somewhere within the minds of a lot of people they have learned uh, or been trained to overlook the issues that are involving the Indian people here on this land because everybody has a stake in the subjugation of Indian people because everybody's living on Indian land because this whole country is Indian country. And so we have to be able to get by our own stuff, which is why dealing with our shared history of violence, healing our historical trauma, and clearing our vision to know where our blocks are to becoming active are really critically important as we go forward and do this work. So it is multi-pronged. It's about political action. It's about organizing in your community. It's about holding those within your own field accountable, um, you know, professionally and um, legally for the the instances where they're breaking the law. Uh, you know, it's about building strong coalitions, but it's also about healing all of these things that block our ability to see why is it that nobody cared about indigenous rights until the toxins started leaking into their own water. You know, we have to be willing to answer those questions, and we have to be able to look at those things if we actually hope to be able to create a movement forward that's going to be unified. And that's going to solve some of these really big problems that we have. We need to reach critical mass, which means we need everybody. Um, so we have to be willing to do all of that work at the same time. Tom? Yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, Sherry really covered it well. Um, and I, I just yeah, had a couple small thoughts, which is that when you think about the multi-prongs, then think about, so if you're looking at the legal prong, think about, class action lawsuits, other civil side lawsuits. Think about uh, the criminal side. So that relates to nonviolent civil disobedience. When you have to defend somebody, that, like Rosa Parks, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and you can gain victories uh, in, the, in, in that legal prong. You think about the media, uh, and that, that itself is uh, many tines in that fork. Uh, but, but you want to use uh, every prong that you can think of, as Sherry mentioned, political. So you're sending people uh, to Washington, D.C. to lobby. When, when you talk to legislators, you find out that, that uh, uh, you, you go in their office and maybe they have a hard hat hanging on the wall there because some mining interest is lobbying them five days a week, uh, you know, 52 weeks a year. Get there. Lobby, lobby these people. Uh, we don't have the, you know, all, all of the money on our side, but if we have the people power on our side, we can do all of these things and overcome that, that deficit. Then we've got the economic prong. Uh, there are both boycotts and boycotts, mm -hmm. uh, so that so that we uh, stop buying certain things and we support other other uh, enterprises and other businesses. Uh, local organic produce, uh, clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. So it, the, only, the only thing that we really have in terms of cognitive functions on the nonviolent side to our advantage that we are hardwired for is creativity. It is illimitable and it is the main source of nonviolent power. All right, great. Um, so we'll go ahead and do one more question. I'm going to kind of combine two since they have a similar tone. Um, but could you both talk to you about some of the most um, popular nonviolent resistant tactics uh, that uh, Native Americans have used in their campaigns? Um, somebody's curious if there's ever been any type of um, collaboration across tribes. Um, so could you kind of talk about, you know, some tactics? <clears throat> Sure. Um, well, I think that we've seen a lot of tactics uh, 
come forward at Standing Rock where people have, um, you know, stood in harm's way to protect what was sacred. They have also at the same time launched um, a public media campaign about what was going on. They have engaged politically and they have engaged legally. Um, all of the things that we're talking about are things that happened um, at Standing Rock. We have, uh, you know, clear civil resistance going on at the same time that all of these other prongs are, are happening. Um, some of the other movements that have been put forth in the past, like Tom and I were talking this morning about the, um, the Trail of Tears march and then the takeover of the BIA in 1972. You know, the purpose of that, because nobody was paying attention to uh, Native rights, this was right on the heels of the Civil Rights Movement. So the purpose of that was to demonstrate, you know, what Indian people in this country have gone through by recreating that path of the Trail of Tears march. Um, and being able to, you know, go through um, the process of bringing to light indigenous issues in all of the, all of the communities that they walk through along the way. It's like, you know, we can't ignore us if we're right here and you have to look at us as we're walking through your community. And so, you know, being able to bring attention to the issues even when the media ignores you, even when uh, politicians ignore you, even when people within your own community who say hi to you in the grocery store and tell you that it's nice to see you don't show up when your way of life and your cultural traditions are being attacked. You know, even when those things are happening, you have to still show up. You have to still bring visibility to these issues. Um, you still have to bring in people that can address the political, the legal, the environmental, um, you know, and the social aspects of, of the movement. And so, um, you know, all of these movements, uh, though they may seem subtly different, they all have those core elements that are, are part of, of the larger movement. That was the same with the Civil Rights Movement. That was the same with the Satyagraha, with Gandhi. All of these movements had all of these multiple, multiple components. Um, and for indigenous rights um, movements that have gone forward, um, there have been some powerful indigenous rights movements that I wish we had time to talk about all of them um, that have taken place, you know, in recent history um, in Central and South America, in the United States, in Canada, where there have been huge victories, where people have put themselves in the path of destruction. Um, what that does is not only does it stop the flow of harm, but there's a cost-benefit analysis attached to that for the company on the other side, that eventually they're going to reach the point where it is no longer profitable for them to proceed if you can hold them back long enough because it's costing them money as you're engaging this practice, uh, warrior practice of Samagnus. You know, there's, there's stra strategy layered in each, each of those prongs. And so, um, you know, we could do a whole day on specifics um, but I think that really, it really comes down to looking at, um, you know, what is the need for protection on the ground? Addressing that. Uh, how can we address this legally? How can we address this politically? How can we address this socially in the larger context of educating people and bringing more people into the movement with us? Um, creating greater sympathy and understanding around the issue. Those are the main areas that we have to work on when we're doing any type of campaign. We have to look at the multi-pronged approach to look at all of those issues and then make sure that those things are steeped in our cultural and traditional values so that we're not perpetuating acts of conquest, um, so that we're not perpetuating a colonial way of being, that we're not creating uh, you know, another instance where we're overthrowing somebody to place somebody else in their stead, that we're actually transcending those behaviors and including people as we're moving the movement forward. So, you know, like I said, I could talk about that for a very long time, but I know that we're running short on time and I want to give Tom a chance to, to have something to say. Well, that was, again, uh, a, a very good roundup of, of uh, exactly what you're talking about. And I, I think I would only add that we've got this sort of long list of, of, um, of tactics that 
uh, Native American and First Nations have used, uh, including uh, encampments, as we saw at Standing Rock, but going back mm -hmm. a long way before that, uh, which mm -hmm. are also um, uh, blockades, uh, <laughs> everything from uh, Ward Valley, where the uh, Indians in the desert there stopped a huge uh, radioactive waste dump by doing a 113-day blockade of the uh, uh, road that entered that area. Um, also, there's there's other things that don't seem as dramatic. Uh, passing resolutions, whether they're binding or non-binding, at various levels of government. Uh, these these actually build public interest. They are interest interesting to uh, various levels of government elected officials, uh, and they begin to talk about things when you bring them. You, as a private citizen, can bring a resolution to your county board, to your city commission, uh, and get them to talk about these issues and think about them. Uh, always seeking more allies. Uh, um, when, for example, the 1991-92, uh, uh, the first summit uh, of people of color environmental groups in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the beginning of that, they were quite impatient with each other. Uh, the African Americans said to the Native Americans, would you stop taking so much time to do your prayers? Uh, and the Native Americans were like, well, you're just, you're, you're in such a rush and you're so political. And my friend Tom Goldtooth said, at the end of three days, they were thanking each other. The African American leadership was thanking the Native American leadership for keeping them centered and really focused, and the uh, uh, Native American leadership was thanking the African American leadership for skilling them up in terms of uh, really hard-edged politics. Uh, so, so we have so much to teach each other. I think that that attitude of of learning from each other uh, and mutual respect is key. So honor that and long journeys. <laughs> uh, Native Americans have engaged in long spirit runs, uh, horseback journeys. These, these are like Gandhi's salt march. They call attention to an issue uh, and they, they, uh, they consolidate support uh, as these journeys are going on. I've been a part of some of those and it, it actually really works well. Finally, I just want to mention the lone emissary tactic, which is, I've seen this in uh, treaty rights struggles, absolutely brave, lone uh, Native Americans will go to, for example, during the treaty rights struggle in northern Wisconsin, uh, my friend uh, Jim Schlender, who was a brilliant tribal attorney, uh, he was the lead of the legal team at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, he would go as a lone person to argue for treaty rights at rod and gun clubs where the racism was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. That had a huge impact and it actually convinced people, I need to show respect to these people because, wow, that is very brave for this lone Native American to show up in a very hostile environment of two or three hundred, uh, quote, sportsmen uh, who were absolutely dead set against treaty rights, in a period of three years, they switched to being in favor of treaty rights. So the lone emissary role is a really interesting and very brave calling out uh, the courage of, of uh, very uh, amazing people. And having seen this in action, I can tell you it is impressive and effective. Well, I just... Um I think that we're living in a in a very precarious time, and um, I also want to remind people that this notion of martyrdom is a, not a traditional value. That that is really a a very it goes back to the idea of conquest and this doctrine of discovery, Christian law of nation stuff. That um, you know, if you're going to do something like that, be well prepared. Um, to be in that position. Jim Slender was an attorney. He was well trained to speak um, on those issues um, that we're not encouraging anybody to put themselves in harm's way as they go forward and, and do this work. Um, another thing that I think people can do is, um, you know, if you're part of a group or part of an organization or you're on the town council, 
you can actually write into your mission statements or your organizational charters or your town charters a commitment to honor and respect um, indigenous rights, the rights of seven gen seven gener the seventh generation, and also the rights of Mother Earth. You know, these are things that you can do that you can incorporate into what you're doing to make it a fundamental part of the values of whatever structure it is that you are engaged in. And when you do that, it causes you to pause and think every time you go to take an action to be mindful. Um, you know, one of the other things that um, Tom and I were talking about at the beginning is, you know, one of the things that I do as part of protocol is, you know, we always acknowledge when I go to some, some place to speak, I always make sure um, I honor, if it's here, I honor my ancestors, um, you know, and acknowledge their presence in that place. If I, when I went to uh, speak in Oregon, I recognized the native people of that land and the ancestors of that land before I spoke. So every time you go somewhere to speak, um, as you're opening the event, you know, take a moment to pause to recognize the original peoples of that land because then you're putting people um, into a place where they have to be mindful of the existence of those people, you know, and what may have happened to them on that land. And you're, you're constantly creating um, um, thoughtfulness about, about Native issues and about Native peoples. And make sure that whatever you're organizing, even if you don't think that it relates to Native issues, that you invite Native people to participate because you like I said, Native issues touch on all issues. They're civil rights issues, human rights issues, environmental issues, they're racial issues. You know, all of these issues are, are connected to Indigenous rights. And so, um, you know, include Native people in your organizing um, and take the initiative to get to know the Native people in your community. You know, sit down with them, talk to them, share a meal with them invite them in or, you know, ask them if you can come to them and, and visit their community. Get to know them as human beings and start building that relationship with them so that when an issue does come up, then you can address it, you know, together. So, All right, those, are, those are a few, a few ideas. <laughs> this has been a right. really fun I want to make, <laughs> I want to make one final note that, um, People who want to learn a lot more about the individual case studies uh, can go to the Swarthmore, Swarthmore College uh, Global Database for Nonviolent Action. Uh, Dave will post that uh, website uh, for everybody to access later, but I can tell you that there are more than 50 cases uh, of nonviolent success in uh, indigenous-led campaigns. And I know that that's just the tip of the iceberg, uh, but those uh, those 50 or so are easily accessible uh, via the wonderful uh, project initiated uh, at, at Swarthmore College. 